the soybean. All right. to astrophotography. Um, he's the Department of Defense professional working in the realm of space and intel. Um, although an amateur astronomer, uh, he's had the privilege of using his astrophotography skills professionally for his agency. Um, Mr. Soika's astrophotography journey started in 2010 with his agency's involvement in the NASA LCROSS mission. He found himself in the unique position of being the only astronomer within the agency and therefore was tasked with imaging the plume on the moon generated by the LCROSS impact. Mr. Soika's passion for astronomy started with his father when he was a boy. His father uh, was instrumental in building several observatories and reflective telescopes, and he still uses his father's homemade 10-inch reflector to this day. Did you bring it with you? I did not, okay. but I can run home. I'm pretty close. All right. Uh, this session is an introduction to the marvelous world of astrophotography. Astrophotography is a specialized type of photography for imaging astronomical objects and large areas of the night sky using an amateur telescope, mount, and available cameras. This session will cover the essentials to produce high quality professional astro images, and it will also cover the tangibles, uh, the hardware, software, books, cameras, and settings, and so on, and the intangibles, uh, the mentors, time and patience, trial and error, etc. of astrophotography. So, go ahead and get started. Thanks, Zach, I appreciate it. Next slide, thank you. <laughs> Next slide, this is the intro. So this is the agenda, and what, what this is gonna, this is broken into two sections. So he mentioned uh, the hardware and all that, the cameras, these are the tangibles. Uh, you know what, next slide, next slide. So when it comes to the hardware, I broke this out by uh, beginner and, and advanced, being that this beginner section is, is probably gonna get you started at somewhere uh, in, in the two to three K range. Uh, where advance is going to be an upward of $10,000 uh, by the time you're all done. So if you want to start, this is where, where you start. You, you're going to want a, a, a six-inch Newtonian or greater. Anything less, you start to lose a lot of the, the detail in uh, your images. The same goes for a refractor. You know, the, the smaller you get, the less light you're, you're going to be pulling in. And uh, additionally, the smaller your optics, the longer you, you have to image something to gather those photons. So you could start small, but you don't want to start too small. Some people will go to Toys R Us and they get a, a telescope that's made of plastic with plastic lenses and they hate it and they put it away right away thinking that this is what astronomy is. And you don't want to spend your, your money on that kind of stuff. You want to buy something that's going to that, that's gonna make you happy. Uh, to begin, you want to mount to these being an alt, alt azimuth or a Dobsonian. Those are your uh, less expensive mounts that can get you started. You, a camera is any DSLR. Now, we're talking about beginner here. So you can also get a planetary camera, which are pretty inexpensive. And then once you go to the more advanced, you're going to want an 8-inch or greater new Newtonian to really get some detail, a 5-inch or greater refractor. You want a focal ratio that's F7 or less. Uh, that's important because if it's F8, F9, it's better for magnification. But what starts to happen is you have to image for a longer period of time. Uh, and I'll explain later on how that comes into play. And then amount, as you go more advanced, you're, you're, you're just going to need an equatorial. There's no way around it. Or also a fork with a wedge. Um, and uh, for your camera, as you go more advanced, you're going to want uh, a hydrogen alpha DSLR that's, modi excuse me, a modified HA DSLR. That's where they change out the filter. Um, so that you can pull in lights that are emitted by nebula. And I'll get to that in, in, in a moment. Next slide. So quickly, these, these are, the, are the different cameras from upwards in cost from 50 for the low end 
planetaries, and th these are basically fancy webcams. So you can start with that, and they're great for, uh, for uh, the moon, they're good for Jupiter and maybe Saturn, but that's about it, and I'll explain why a little bit later. Uh, DSLRs will start to range from 400 from the older ones to some of the newer ones in, in excess of 2,000. Or you can get the dedicated deep space CCD cameras, which can go from one to eight thousand uh, dollars. But that's when you want to get more advanced. Next, one of the issues you have with cameras too. So this is important. A lot of people want to use their webcams, or they want to use their uh, camera phones. This is the example that if you were to actually put your camera phone up to this particular nebula, this is all you'd be able to image. And it, it wouldn't even look this good, but that's about the space you would get for the low cost 6.4 by 4 by 8 uh, cameras. So your big Canon cameras and your more expensive Ni uh, Nikons that are full frame will give you this range of shot. So if you're gonna purchase a camera for the purposes of doing astrophotography, you have to take this into account. I have cameras that are both uh, full frame and APS-C, and that's good enough for me. Next. Two forms of astrophotography, there's prime focus and there's afocal or uh, projection. So let me get on this side with the light. Um, prime focus is, this is where you actually mate the camera directly to the telescope, and the telescope actually acts as your telephoto lens. So if you have a big Dobsonian or, or a big Newtonian and you plug it in, that whole scope becomes your in essence, your, uh, your uh, telephoto lens. Most astrophotographers will tell you to go this route, and there's a bunch of reasons behind it, but you need two additional pieces before you connect your DSLR, so you may want it, since you're getting into this. You're gonna want the T-ring, so you get a T-ring for a Canon, a T-ring for a Nikon, depends on what your camera is, and then you get this T-adapter that connects that T-ring to, to the telescope and you're ready to go. And then when you wanna focus, you actually can just use the focuser, look, look through the diopter of the camera, and uh, start to image. The other way, other way to do it is with eyepiece uh, projection, where you put something that's in the middle, where this actually is, is an added piece to make your image perhaps bigger, to come into focus. But as, as you do this, the more elements you add, it begins to take away from some of your light, and the more elements you add will also start to decrease your uh, definition, your, your clarity. Plus the camera gets longer and actually starts to hang on your telescope and almost curve from the length. So I don't know why you'd want to go through that aggravation. I would just go straight through prime focus. Next slide. Basic settings for DSLR. When I first started this, I'm like, what settings do I need? And I searched the web high and low, like what do I start at? So what I discovered, which I think would be helpful for people, is the settings you want is to go in your camera and you want to set it for manual or bulb. And bulb is going to be used if you have one of those remote uh, switches. Start in an ISO for 800, that should be almost universal. White balance to auto, uh, auto rotate off, mirror flip. Uh, how many know what the mirror flip function is? Anybody? Okay. Do you want to explain it? Perfect, perfect. That's why I went with the Sony uh, translucent lens so it does flip. All right, so you've got that, 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 that benefit. And you'll see it when, when, you, when you take a picture. If, as soon as you, you flip that mirror, it's going to vibrate the image and be taking the picture. And like, well, that's why my picture is one big smudge. So you want to flip the mirror up, wait for it to tie down, like you said, and then take the picture. Uh, long exposure noise reduction for images three minutes or less. So what am I talking about? Cameras, most... Uh, DSLRs have a function from Nikon to Canon that I know, uh, long exposure noise reduction. So if you're going to image something for three minutes or more, you want to turn it off. And, I'll, and the reason is, after you take an image to remove the noise, you've got to take something call, called a dark frame. And what a dark frame does is it captures the noise and then it subtracts it from your picture so you have a nice clean picture. But so if you take a picture for four minutes, then the camera then has to take another picture with the shutter closed for four minutes. 
So one picture just took you eight minutes. And I will tell you, when you're out in the field freezing at night, you want to get this done as quick and as efficiently as possible. So you save your dark frames for last. However, it is recommended that if you're doing three minutes or less, let's just do the dark frames now. So each picture is only taking six minutes. And let's just get through these. Uh, next slide. So the Banatov mask, the almighty Banatov mask, which has destroyed many astrophotographers. So you are going to need this. Uh, there's no way. Uh, so if you're going to focus on a, on a nebula, people will ask me, how do you focus on a nebula or a galaxy? It's just a hunk of gas. I mean, how do you do it? So what you do is before you go to, so the nebula pretty much all focus at infinity. Just keep that in the, ba in, in, in the back of your mind. So then you want to swing over to a star before you image that nebula. You want to focus, and that focus will be at in infinity. And what happens is as you focus and you go left and right, what you want to do eventually is create this perfect hash mark. So you stick this on the front of your telescope. You focus until you, you, you get this perfect focus. Then you remove it. Do not touch anything. Lock it down and make it tight. Do not focus. Don't adjust anything. Swing to your nebula and start to image. If you mess with it, and this, you're, you're going to go out of focus. But... I will guarantee you, because every astrophotographer I've ever met has left that sucker on, took multiple images for hours, and then they're like, their stars are skewed, their image is skewed. And so I have learned to keep one screw on the front so it hangs, and when I slew to take my image, it just falls off. Best hint I can tell you. Ne next slide. The remote timer, the remote switch. So it, this comes in handy for a variety of reasons. Uh, first, when you're taking a picture with the camera, you may do the, the mirror up, but if you're using your finger as you mirror up and then take the picture, well, guess what? You just made, made your telescope go like this and your, 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 your picture's a big smear. So you want a remote switch where you're not touching it. You, you, you do the mirror flip, you wait for it to stop for a second, and then you image. What these also let you do is, if I want to take 20 pictures of something, I can set this up to take 20 pictures in succession for an exposure time of seven minutes, and I want tw 20 of, the, of, of, of those pictures. So you could set this up to go on autopilot, do the imaging for you while you walk away, talk to your friends, or, or do something else. But these are a necessity for astrophotography. So you need the Banatov mask, and you need one of these. I, don't, I would argue with you if you think you don't need one. Next. And, and yes, got it. That's another name. Absolutely. So uh, beginner astrophotography. So if you have a Dobsonian, you bought big optics because you want to do astrophotography. I hate to say this. I've got a Dob myself, but it's limited in what you can do with astrophotography. And I'll, I'll get into that in, in a moment. But you can do all, 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 all planetary. You could do deep space objects with a magnitude or eight or less. Now, that's my opinion. That can fluctuate a little bit. Uh, like, for example, the Orion Nebula is like seven, some, something like that. So that's something that you can take an image of in 30 seconds. But why is that important? I'll tell you in a second. Uh, and the recommended ISO settings are between 800 to 3200. Now, th this is kind of high. And, uh, but the reason is because Dobsonians don't rotate like an equatorial mount, which I'll explain in a second. Um, if you image something for more than 30 seconds, you start to get blur. Even if your go, even if your go-to mount is motorized, it's still going to struggle. You're still going to get a smear, oh, and and you might luck out, and you might actually luck out and and get a good shot. But if you're doing planetary, you do planetary by taking video. Um, and I think I'll cover that later on. But I just want to say that the, for a Dobsonian, these are the basic settings. And you can do all planetary and some deep space objects with a magnitude of eight or less. Next slide. So one of the challenges with a Dob is uh, where the focal point is on the, in relation to the, to, to the eyepiece. And a lot of people, when they, when they get a camera and they're going to use their Dob like this, they find out that they can't get the focal point of the camera. Got it. And you can't get the focal plane to the sensor to go, you're, to go there. You're absolutely right. 
Yeah, so as you begin to zoom in and bring your image into focus, you'll find out that you can't focus in anymore, and you're, you're just shy of focusing with, with your DAB. But a way around that, too, is to use a, uh, and it's, it's not the best way, but it's to use a, um, to, to, to use a PowerMate or a, a um, Barlow, which will help bring it into focus. But that's kind of what you're stuck with. Next. Uh, so I was, this is, this is a good segue. So you, if you're going to do planetary imaging, you want to, so I use a, a 4X power made. It's made by Teleview. It's a beautiful thing. It's like a Barlow, but without the vignetting. Um, you want to manual focus through a live view mode. So if you have a camera, you, you, you can look at what that is, but that's basically, you can see your image on the back of your camera and, and you eye focus. You can't use a Banatov mask. You can, but you have to know what to look for. But why even deal with that? What, what you want to do is actually just focus until your picture is nice and clear on the back of your camera. Uh, this is almost a lock. Uh, so, you, so you also want to shoot um, videos for 10 to 30. So how do you image a planet? Of course, you could just take a picture, but you're not going to get a whole lot of definition. It's something that's this big and this clear. What, what you need to do is use is you take video, and then there's an application called Registax. I think the latest version is 6.02. It's very important. It's called Registax. And what that allows you to do is take your video, uh, and actually will lay out the frames, and then you select what you see as the best frame. And then what it does is it puts it at the front, and it'll take all su subsequent, sub excuse me, subsequent pictures or frames of the video and stack them from best to worst. And then what you can say is, Get rid of this 75%, keep this 25% of good frames, and stack them. And then when you will be amazed at what comes out. So I'm not gonna give a lecture on Registax, I just wanted to say, if you're gonna do it, it's free, it's a route to go. Uh, the inner planets, the outer planets, you, you, you will come to learn that you know, for Venus and, and uh, Mercury, you're gonna be at about 100, and that's even kind of, you, know, you may need a filter that they're so bright. As you go out to Jupiter and Saturn, that's about the right ISO setting. And then by the time you're, bring, you're going out to Neptune and Uranus, you, 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 you want to get as high as 3,200 just to see it. Uh, and then you just want to clean up in Photoshop or something like that. Uh, next, next slide. So advanced astrophotography. This is how you take the real good pictures that you see on the Internet that some people will say, hey, is, is that a Hubble picture? And you go, no, I took that picture. It makes you feel good. So you need an equatorial mount. I'll go into the reason why in a, in a second. It needs to be got, it, you're, you're gonna need a, a guide scope, w w which is this one right here. Uh, you're also gonna need an, an, an auto guider camera. Uh, you're gonna want a better camera, like a Hydrogen Alpha modified DSLR, a, a mono or some type of uh, deep, space, uh, deep space camera. Uh, you want a good APO. There's achromatic refractors, and they're fine, but if you really want to do astrophotography and good, crisp, clean pictures, get one called an APO. Uh, that's apochromatic. That's where all the light comes to focus in one point and it's not scattered. Um, and you want a good size Newtonian. Uh, more optics is always good. As much as the mount can hold, that's, that's probably a, a, good, uh, a good delineator. You want a remote switch or a timer. You're going to want Photoshop. I'll go into that in a second. Uh, you, you're going to need extra batteries. Uh, you will be out there in the field, and you want the power packs. You want extra batteries because you will, especially when it gets cold, you're going to need batteries. Uh, it's good to have a field flattener or a focal reducer. If you want to capture photons quickly, you buy something called a focal reducer. If you're finding out that you're, you're at, at the ends of your pictures, your stars are stretched, you're going to want something called a field flattener, and that's really for Newtonians. Uh, you're going to want filters. Uh, look for these keywords, uh, HA, hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, oxygen three, and sulfur two. Those are some of the most popular uh, filters, excuse me. Those are the most popular light wavelengths emitted by nebula in the cosmos. I mean, of course, there, there's others, but most of the nebulas you're going to come across are at these wavelengths. So you want to buy, buy some of those. You're also going to need a, a, dew, a dew heater. Of course, at night when the dew settles, it settles on, on your lens, messes things up. So you're going to need a, uh, a dew heater that heats up your telescope by a few degrees uh, to keep off the dew. I cheat. I, I, I didn't want to buy a, a dew heater, so I buy hand warmers that you use for skiing. I stick those in key places in, the, in my telescope. Works just fine. Next slide. 
So why do I need uh, a uh, Equatorial versus a Dobsonian or a fork? So here's the real reason. The only real difference you see in this picture is th there's no rotation in, in, a, in a Dobsonian. So if you look at this picture of the, of, so I used to think this was, this was Orion's shield. He's actually holding the lion mane. But if you see, it's not pointing in this direction. Now it's pointing here. Now it's pointing to the side. Now it's pointing in the lower right-hand corner because that's the way that these things move across. They, they move across the sky. So if you took a picture with a Dobsonian, with a, you know, with a, a, a long exposure, you're going to get one big smear. So you've got to get an equatorial mount that actually rotates. So you'll see here that, that the lion's mane is always pointing in the same direction of this box. And if your alignment is good, you can, you can image up to half an hour to two hours. Okay, D it depends on, 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 on your batteries. Uh, are there any questions about this? S is that pretty clear? Good, next slide. Advance, what kind of imagery can you do with a go-to equatorial? Well, all planetary, all deep sky objects, exposure times from a few seconds to hours, which sometimes you're, go you're gonna need that. Uh, recommended uh, setting is IS, uh, ISO 800 or less. N next slide. Yeah. yeah. Here's where the Banatov mask comes into uh, uh, it, it, it comes in handy. Uh, you're going to want to focus on a star. Swing over to to your nebula, and, you, and you'll you'll be able to take your picture. Um, you're going to want something with, with the flip function, ISO setting again 800 uh, with white balance to auto. Five minute exposure. So the first thing you want to start to do, trust me people, is I guess if you get out there and you're like, well, how long should I take, I t I take a picture for, right? And so, I mean, is it two minutes? Is it a half hour? How, how do I know? I recommend st starting at, at, at five minutes. You will capture something in five minutes, tr trust me. Uh, but then you're going to say, but how do I know if it's good enough? I'll explain it on, on the next slide. And then if, if it's too light or too dark, you want to increase or decrease the exposure time by about 30 seconds, and then you'll start to figure things out. Um, when you take your pictures, you want to take 21 images, light frames at least. So when people say light frames, you're know, like, what's a light frame? A, a light frame is your picture you're taking. So then there's dark frames where uh, you want to take at least 9 to 12 of those and then flat frames and bias frames. How many know what a dark frame is? I think I already explained that, right? You got it. Uh, light frames, does somebody want to explain a flat frame? Go ahead. So uh, your, your goal here is to uh, correct for the big daddy of your, of your optic. So it turns out that the sensor, the optics, and all that uh, aren't equally uh, sensitive across the entire field. So you want to shoot a uniform Mm -hmm. A t-shirt hung over the front of your telescope and another. But what you're trying to do is, is provide a uniform amount of illumination, take a picture of it. That's what a, a flat frame is. And then in software, it looks at that and it says, uh, you told me that all of these should be the same. These aren't, so I need to make a, a, a software correction. And it's then going to apply to all of your lights. Yep. So it's a way of uh, getting rid of, uh, you might have some dust in your optic. Yep, you got it. Keep your, your, uh, if you're try trying to fix dirty optics, you have to keep the relation of your camera sensor to your optical chain always the same because that, that won't track. But that's what, that's what it's like. Yeah. So succinctly, when you take a dark frame, you, know, you, you want to put the, uh, you want to take your camera off and put the cover back on it or stick something black over your uh, telescope and take 9 to 12 frame pictures uh, for the same length of time in ISO setting as the picture you just took of the light object. Okay, so that's simple. The flat frames, or uh, as you just explained, you want to stick something white that's over the, the top of your, your, your telescope and take pictures, and that, what that allows you to do is, often the pictures are uneven in color, and th this will make it flat across the board. So that's, uh, and then bias frames is all the static noise that's in, 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 in your camera. You just want to take, so that's really simple to do. Your bias frame is you set your camera to the highest speed possible and, go and you take about, about 10 pictures quickly. 
and that captures all of the bias that's in your camera. So applications like, so this is free, this is another one, Deep Sky Stacker, best application out there that I, I love it for astrophotography, is it'll ask you, please give me your light frames, please give me your dark frames, your, your flat frames, your, your bias frames, and it does the processing for you so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and you'd be amazed what's going to happen. So I will go over that in a second. Uh, but that's the stuff you need for advanced astrophotography. Next, next slide. So this is like the almighty screen on picture taking. So your quality is a function of ISO and time. Um, so you can take a picture at 1,200, excuse me, uh, 12,800 for one minute which, just so you know, your picture is going to come out like this with all this noise. Or you could take a picture at a setting of between four to 800. Uh, th th this is for my telescope, but it'll be, it'll be very similar to yours. Uh, for about, about seven to eight minutes, and you get this kind of result. So it's going to be cleaner and sharper, and there's less noise. So here quickly is just the pros and cons. If you want to take a picture quickly, then fine. You, you, you could set it to 6400 or 2800 and your picture is only for, for one or two minutes. So your pros are shorter expo exposures, you're, you're, you're saving battery, but less color depth and more color noise. So if you're taking a quick picture, you're not collecting a whole lot of data. What's happening is the data you, you just collected in that instant is being amplified. So you haven't really collected a lot of depth and color and, uh, and, and color range. But if you do 400 or 100 or 200, uh, you're collecting more data over a longer period of time and your pictures will be cleaner, sharper, with you know, more changes in color. You'll, you'll, you'll begin to see definition. Uh, so that's, this is the inverse, basically. So if you have the lower ISI, you know, you get but you get more noise from heat. But thank God for the invention of dark frames, you can get rid of that noise. Um, are there any questions about this? Is that pretty clear? So if you're talking about multiple frames at a higher... I, I So, um, I, you know what, the, the, my next slide might answer that, but I will tell you, I, I've read books on this stuff, and they have an example of something that's 10 at one minute versus one at 10 minute, okay? And so, generally speaking, the one at 10 minutes comes out slightly better, but almost unnoticeable. But you don't want to do one at 10 minutes because... If you do one at 10 minutes, a 10 minute exposure means I have to leave my shutter open for 10 minutes. And in that time, an airplane can fly through. A light flash. If somebody, some kid with his flashlight shines it in and you just ruined it, you bump it. Satellites. Satellites are like that. I don't think people realize how much space junk is out there. But when you're out there imaging, I, it, it is a lock that you will capture a satellite. It's, it's so that's really the benefit. You know, and so, and then when you do the uh, flat fields, you, you can actually wash out the satellites because it's not the average of all the pictures. So uh, there, you go the other way though. So you say, all right, so we don't want to go 10 minutes. Let's go 20 seconds and we'll do uh, 50 at 20 seconds. That'll be the same as you know, doing that frame. Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, so uh, you have to, so if you can think of the, the each CCD as a well. You could. You could. That's, that's, that's one of the downsides, too, is you just spend 10 minutes, and then you realize you just overexposed or you underexposed, so you have to increase it 30 more seconds or something. Is there a way to judge what There is. I'm glad you asked. Next slide. So 
Oh, uh, so I hope you can see this. Oh, so this is actually a very good slide. When you take your picture, if you click the info button on, on a Canon, but I'm not sure, I'm sure the Nikon's got the same thing. You're gonna get this thing that shows like a red, green, and blue histogram and, and, and right here. So, darn it, it's kind of hard to see here. Um, you want your histogram to be at the second line between the second and the third and peaked out right here, okay? That is when you have the perfect photo. Anything beyond this, you're overexposing. Anything here, you're underexposing. Um, so let's just say that I took a picture at five minutes. So this is a question for you. This is going to help people too, I think. If I took this picture at five minutes at 800 ISO and the histogram was right here, I'm, I'm underexposed. What do I need to do? And that's the recommended thing to do is to increase the exposure time. So all of a sudden you're going to increase it by 30 seconds or, or one minute. And you start to get good. You'll, you'll start to get to the point like this needs to be increased by two minutes or one minute. But, but if you're a beginner, you want to do it in 37 increments. And this will, will start to shift. Um, any questions on this slide yet? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And so once you take one like that, that's when you want to start to rock and roll and take your, your 21 pictures. That's, that's when you're good to go. You know, I'll, I'll actually use the ISO 6400 and the, the uh, 12800 uh, to find a target. Because a lot of times you're like, I've moved my telescope, but it, is the nebula there? So you may want to take a 30 second quick exposure so it shows up on the camera and go, okay, good. Because you don't want to do all this to find out I wasn't even looking at the target. So. You want to do a quick exposure, find your target, take a picture, test it. This is basically your, your, your test shot. And you want to increase or decrease your ISO accordingly. And once you're there, I'll, I'll show you why that's important uh, shortly. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. and, and trust me, I'm below the amateur. Yeah. Right, so I'm trying to figure these kinds of things out too. So what I have found just with my experimentation, if I shorten the exposure or lower the ISO, yeah. I don't get that neighbor's porch light, you know, washing into my you know, blue sky out of the picture. That's true. So the way to combat that are with filters. I'm sure you already know that. Uh, and your... When you increase ISO, what that's really doing is that's an amplifier to take whatever photons it's getting. So if, if you're getting something from your neighbor, it's going to take that and just multiply it. I mean, the only benefit to increasing your ISO is to wash out your picture and maybe, you know, to, to, f to, f to find your, your target. So the, the lower the ISO, the better. Uh, but there's a point of uh, diminishing returns because if you go to 2 or 100, you just have to take a picture for so long and it, and it, gets, it gets tedious. Mm -hmm. But they're not all the same. Uh, this, they're not the, the 100 and 200 are not uh, quite as sensitive. Correct. Right? So there are some native uh, sensor uh, settings that uh, aren't fictitious. There are some that are fictitious, just some that map inside of the, uh, the, the camera. The 800 is one of the ones that is a native uh, ISO. So that's why it's, uh, it's, it's recommended. If you've got lots of light, 100 is another native one. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, so you have to, if, if you be good at this, uh, you have to know what that's actually happening inside of the camera to make the most of, of what you can. You do. So what does the x-axis say with the lens? Here? Yeah. So that is the amount of exposure. So what begins to happen is, um, this is going to get complicated. So in your Bayer matrix, your camera sensor, uh, I guess I'll, I'll call them buckets, as they collect photons, if so many photons hit a certain uh, bucket, it knows 
so let's just say they're, they're supposed to be red photons. It begins to uh, get deeper and richer and redder as you go this way, okay? Um, but once there's too much red in the bucket, it begins to overflow, and then you, you just, it becomes overexposed. So what this is telling you going this way is um, the amount of exposure that you're putting onto those buckets. Black. Histogram, yeah. Yep. And I've got a slide that's coming up that'll get more a little bit more into it. Go ahead. Got it. You're, you're going to find out that a lot of your junk your is, is, is captured in here. There's a lot of your noise that is captured over here. And I'll explain how to get rid of that in, in uh, the next slide. Just, uh, are we good on time? Oh, yeah. You don't have to, but I recommend it. 22 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, next slide. The auto guider. Okay, so this thing called the, the auto guider, this is a Celestron brand. I don't endorse them, it's just the picture I can find on the internet. But this, um, you can see in this picture, there's a little black dot that's a star. It's, 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 it's made it to a, uh, a, a small telescope. And if you're going to image a nebula or a galaxy or something, you want to find a, a bright star that's located in there. And you want to use the handheld control to center this star into those crosshairs. Now, there's software that's going to help you do all this. But once you lock onto a star, uh, there's some calculus that's performed uh, that does um, uh, star drifting, direction, this, that, and the other. And once it decides that it's going to lock on, it'll start to send signals to your equatorial mount to make pixel level cor corrections. You're going to need one of these. So if you're going to image a nebula for hours on end, you really can't have things drifting for more than a couple of pixels. Uh, this is a must if you're going to do long exposure astrophotography. You're going to have to get a smaller scope, and you're going to you're have to get the, the, the auto guider. Uh, there, are there any questions on this? Or OK. Next slide. So this is an, an example that I put together of, of how to bring this all, all, all together with the histogram. So that picture you saw before looked just like this, right? You saw the one that was in, in back of the camera. So here in the front here is where most of your ambient noise is, is going to be. Uh, and you want to get rid of it, but not all of it. And I'll explain it to you in a second why. But the first thing you want to do, so this is Photoshop. It doesn't have to be Photoshop. These are these are capabilities found in almost all uh, photo-based applications. So you want to bring in your, your uh, in so I probably I need to back up. Once you use Registax or Deep Sky Stacker to create your picture, you're going to get a TIFF. That's what, that's what they produce. You take that TIFF, you bring it into your application. And the first thing you're going to see is it's going to look black and white. It's going to look horrible. It's not even like, where's my picture? Don't worry. We're going to bring out that picture. So once you bring in the picture, you want to adjust the levels of the histogram. This is known as stretching. We all hear this word, stretching. What does it mean? So what you want to do is 
you want to take this slider and move it to the right, and it gets rid of it. It's going to delete all, all the noise that's in front of the histogram. But what I've learned is you don't want to go right up and butt up against it because this little bit right here tends to be the nebulosity that's found in nebulas. A lot of people will try to clip it r right up to where it starts, but guess what? It just goes from black to your image, and you lose the, the, the nebulosity. Then you want to take this uh, background slider, which is, kinda, which is your brightness, and move it forward to where it just begins to touch your, your histogram. You hit OK, and that's going to clip all that's in back and all that's in front. And that's going to get rid of a whole bunch of noise. It's, it's going to help you out. Se second thing you want to do, sorry to explain this, the uh, slider to the right, you got that. And then click OK, next slide. So, what I, so the next thing to do is to increase your vibrance and your saturation. Your saturation, and all that's doing is it is increasing the color that's already there. It's magnifying your color. So if something's red, it's going to make it redder. If something's blue, it's going to make it bluer. So we just saw from that stacked picture that looked black and white, there was data there, but it wasn't brought out yet. And the way you bring that out is by using your, your saturation. So in this case, uh, I recommend that if you have, if you increase the, uh, vi the vibrancy by 20, you want to make your, your saturation at 40. If you want to make, you can increase this to uh, 30, this should probably be near 60. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. As you actually move the, these sliders, you'll actually visually start to see what's happening, and then you can eyeball and see, you know what, it actually looks best right here. Uh, click OK. Oh. Yeah, it's just making it brighter. It's making r blues a little bit more, well, vibrant. It's kind of a hard, uh, but you'll notice the difference. I mean, it's, it's on your television at home. You can increase vibrancy and it makes your picture sharper. You'll see it. Uh, next slide. The infinite curve. So one of the things you want to do is you want to make an S curve in your, uh, you can't see the histogram. It's, it's very small here right now, is um, you, you want to bring in your histogram and you want to make this gentle S curve. And what this does is, this uh, increases contrast here, increases brightness here, and your, your picture will just start to come out. So when you make a picture, don't take my word for it, make an S-curve and judge for yourself. And you'll see if it, if it enhances your, your, uh, your image, and I, I'm betting it will. Next slide. Next thing you want to do, uh, so these are just the basics, is increase your brightness again and your contrast. I always keep the, the rule of thumb that if my brightness, that my contrast should always be half of my brightness whatever that should be. So for this particular picture, I, be, I began to bring it out at about 65. I, sl I slid, slid over my contrast. It, it created some definition. Uh, and uh, when I was done with this image, I just didn't want to uh, take a, a another slide. But I also ran the despeckle. It's an algorithm that you find in most photo applications. And that kind of took out all this little speckling that was in there and it, and it made it smooth. The final result was this next slide. And, and so, Believe me, it looks better on the computer screen than it does on this on this this projector. But that's the basics. Now, you do want to tweak it. One of the things you have to do is still do some tweaking. And you might find out, you know, I need to increase more saturation or less contrast. Uh, next slide. So resources, lots of books out there. Uh, hit hit the, the the down arrow one more time. So this is the best book I've ever read on astrophotography. If you're going to get a book, get the Backyard Astronomer's Guide. We actually have it at Novak. You can take it out. But it has all the information about the mount, the type of mount you should use, how to set it up, the polar alignment. And it actually gets into astrophotography. And this is the one book that I go to the most right here. Next slide. Yeah. And you know what was the benefit? Is I have a scope. It's a... It's a um, uh, not a sky master it's a uh uh i, I forgot the, the name of my mount um, um Jesus, it's a german brand but that is 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 actually the um the example that they use in the book so it, it it's actually helping me because it's using my mount in in that book um Resources, websites these are probably the most popular you you can go to novak you can go to cloudy nights which is popular Astromark for buying stuff if you want to swap. And b believe it or not, Facebook. So benefit of Facebook, I have connected with a lot of astrophotographers across the globe. One of the guys I connected with was a guy named Damien Peach. How many people know, know Damien? 
couple of people. So when I have questions, I actually ask him. And so it's just kind of funny. I'll probably post a picture of me at doing this event, and he'll post a picture at Cambridge or something. So, <laughs> so next slide. But that's how I met him. It was on, it was on Facebook. Uh, resources mentors. You find your mentors in clubs so, so, such as Novak. Uh, one of the guys I became friends with was a guy by the, by the name of Bob Traub. I, I'd like to give him props. Bob sat with me for hours to explain it to me. I, I, he was my mentor for the longest time, and he still is. He's a good friend today. Uh, you've got colleagues at work. So I work for an agency that actually has nuclear physicists. It's packed full of nuclear physicists. When I have questions about hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta, uh, and there's an astrophysicist standing in the back in the green, uh, so these are the types of guys that when I have questions about wavelengths and things like that, I, I, I can go to those guys. I mean, that's one of them. That's one of them. Uh, Facebook, observatories. Uh, so, you know, I've uh, been doing some work with the uh, Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and uh, I've been working with the curator, and uh, lots of information to be found there. Uh, the Smithsonian's uh, universities. We have Professor Geller, who's there for your convenience if you want to ask him questions. Um, so that is a wealth of information. So I have used these people to fill in the gaps because you read these books, but you're still like, kind of confused what hydrogen alpha is and what they mean by wavelength. And these are the kind of guys that can fill in that information. Next slide. Lessons learned. This will happen for all of you who want to get into astrophotography. If you don't, then you're probably uh, omnipotent. You will make mistakes, you will error, believe me. Uh, you will forget something. You'll be in the field and you realize that you forgot an Allen wrench. You forgot to bring a power cord. So you double up, but it's not always going to. You will break something and not have a spare or a tool to fix it, which has happened to me. I can't tell you how many times I've walked over to my mentor, Bob Traub, said, Bob, do you have an extra power cord? Do you have an extra Allen wrench? And he looks at me and he rolls his eyes. I, I can't blame him. Uh, you will bump your scope. It, it, it will happen. You'll be imaging for a while, and then you kick it. You go, damn it, I just r r ruined that picture. And then you can stop it and start again. Uh, you will forget to take off your Banatov mask. You know what? You, I'm banking for the first try. You won't take my word for it. And you, you think you're going to remember to take it off, but you won't. Uh, you will do everything right, and the technology will fail. For some reason, I have been out there in the field, and because it was cold or because of the humidity, I couldn't focus. I couldn't slew my telescope right. Even though I kept doing the three-star alignment over and over, it would not go to the target that I wanted to. For whatever reason, technology will fail. I have spares. Uh, wind will blow, ruining shots. Dew will form. The ground will shake. People walk by. They jump. Kids who are happy will jump by your scope. Bump it. Uh, car lights will flash. There's always that guy that wants to leave early. Go, sir? Good man. And that's what, that's what you should be doing. A lot of people don't know that, though. So we have to inform them. Uh, flashlights will shine, ruining a shot. I've had people that when I'm imaging, they go, oh, what's down? And they shine the flashlight. Well, you just ruined it for me. So, but, but you can't get mad because it will happen. Aircraft and satellites will fly through. There is no way around it. Uh, but don't give up. Don't give up because you're finally going to get a picture that you're going to love. And it's like golf. Once you get good at it, you're going to love it, and it becomes addictive. Next, next slide. So what's next? What's next for me? What is next in the world of advanced astrophotography that I'm starting to get into now is uh, HDR, astrophotography, high, di high d d dynamic range, and the Hubble palette. Quickly, high di dynamic range is where you actually take a picture that's underdeveloped. So it's funny that you were a asking me about these, these developments. You actually underdevelop, you develop, and then you, you actually take pictures where you overexpose. Then using HDR software that is sometimes in the camera itself, but there's software for it. You can actually take your picture, say, this one's my, un my underdeveloped one, my, my, my perfect one, and then, and then it actually computes a range, and it stretches your picture for you. And this is a picture of the Orion Nebula after it's been done through 